Corporal Steve Voigt, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed Steve in St. Charles, Missouri. It was actually my second trip to Missouri in 2007. It was November the 3rd. And Steve was 58 years old at the time. He's still with us today. And he tells an amazing story of his experience in Vietnam as a young man. He went over to Vietnam in 1970, spent 1771 in Vietnam, went to Fort Leonard, Missouri for his basic training and Fort Sam Houston, Texas for his advanced training. He was trained to be a combat medic, folks. And he was served with the second of the 12th B Company, third platoon, first air calf of the Air Mobile Division in Vietnam. Tremendous story. Steve, I thank you so much for sharing your story. He, I actually got a couple of pictures of a car that he had a picture on his car. I'll, I'll let you watch it, uh, see it. It's really amazing. So I want to thank George Long, William Jones, and Carol Lee Berry for making it possible for you to watch and to listen to Steve's story. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. I appreciate your support of my work and uh, your passion for our country and our veterans and helping me to continue these stories. I, I really, on behalf of our younger generation and the families of these veterans, thank you so much for your support. Folks, I'd like to encourage you to sponsor one of these stories. Um, there's many of them to sponsor. There's information in the video description on my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on the link that says Sponsor a Vet, or you can donate to my work. There's information in the comment section of this video. I want to remind you that my Voices of History radio station is broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, KBOH, Grand Junction, Colorado. You can access it through my website, LarryCapetto.com. It's on the home page, the player's there. You can download the app at the Apple App Store, type Voices of History. There's a link in the video description. You can just click on it and go right there. Download the app, it's free. And then it will, it will be in the Google Play Store shortly. For some reason, Google's just taking their time, but it will eventually be available on the Android platform. So, But you can watch it on my website if you don't have that right now. I want to encourage you to just support that station too. It's listener support. It, it's so great. I listen to it all day, all day long. I just click on my phone while I'm in the car, uh, shaving, taking a shower, whatever I'm doing, eating. And I just, it's at my fingertips. And it's in our young people's hands today, folks. I want them especially to access this radio station and our truck drivers, those out there that are driving trucks. I love our truck drivers. I salute all of them. Thank them for what they do, their service to our country backbone of America also. So anyways, a lot to share here. My heart's full. This is the 20th anniversary of my work, folks. And I'm just happy to share these stories with you. Subscribe to this channel. Share this video. Another great story from Vietnam, Steve Voigt. Thank you for watching and listening. God bless you. You're a young one, young guy, huh? Yeah. What year were you in Vietnam? 70, 71. Were you drafted? I was, go I was going to be drafted, I had my uh, physical and decided I didn't want to be infantry. So I went to a recruiter and asked him what he had. And he didn't have anything that I liked for two years. So I said, what do you got for three years? And I saw a medic, and I, th I was thinking hospital. So I said, I'll take an extra year to be a, a medic. And it turned out that uh, I spent virtually my whole time with uh, the infantry. So you went to training where? Uh, I had basic training at, at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, and then uh, 10 weeks at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. That's just outside of San Antonio and got orders for Vietnam, came home on leave, got married, and went over. 
So you're training to be a combat medic. Uh, is that yeah. uh, is is it tough? Is it are they preparing you for obviously for combat? I mean, are they telling you you're going to be in combat soon and you better learn this stuff? I mean, what were they? No, they didn't tell you that. They just you just went to uh, classes, different classes, and I. Can you really to, sim simulate though combat? No, no. They give you, you know, scenarios, but it wasn't nothing like the real thing. And it was really just cursory training for for the real thing. It and after I got over there, all I just kept thinking, you know, what if this happened? And I'd go over in my mind what I would do, what if that would happen. So, because I knew I was not prepared. The training was not enough. And it scared me. Tell me about what you remember the first time you went in country. Where you were, what you felt, smelt, saw. I mean, what do you remember about arriving on a plane or whatever, however you got over there? Uh, I imagine like everyone else, the heat. And there was a smell. And then... Uh, in process, that when we I got attached to the uh, first cavalry division, we had to go through uh, a few days of cursory jungle training, and then I got uh, assigned to a unit and flew into uh, Song Bay, and the Lerps asked me if I wanted to join them. I said, well, I would like to get some experience first. So I turned them down, and uh, the next day the company came in, and then I was attached to a platoon. And uh, I stayed with that platoon until we got uh, disbanded because of uh, lack of uh, personnel, too many got wounded one day. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about your tour there. One year? One year. What outfit or division or company were you with? I was with the 2nd and 12th B Company, 3rd Platoon. Is that part of the 1st Cav? With the 1st Cavalry Division, so Air, Air Mobile. 2nd of the 12th, what is that? 2nd uh, Company or Division? 2nd Brigade. 12th Cav. Okay. But it's part of the 1st Cav? Yeah. They've got, you know, they've got the 1st uh, Brigade, 2nd, 3rd, 4th. What was your rank? Uh, I was a PFC when I was there. When I got there, I made E4. And after I got back to the States, I made E5. Tell me the, how a, a medic is attached to a company. Is there one medic for a company, a division, or how, tell me how that works? A company, I mean, a medic is assigned, on paper, is assigned to headquarters company. But from there, we are assigned to a platoon. They tried to have one medic per platoon, and you just stayed there with that platoon, unless you, for some reason, need to be switched around, but I, I, I never switched around until uh, I served my time and they got new medics in because old ones were going out and I became a uh, company or senior aid man. I stayed with the uh, company commander and the weapons platoon. Tell me about the first time you experienced combat, where you were, what you remember about it, and what you had to do. We were going down to a clearing to get resupplied, and the point man went past the corner of the clearing and into the jungle, and he got shot. Someone said, Go get him. I I just ran out there and uh, 
went and got him, and as I was looking over him, someone else came out. It just happened to be, uh, found out later, the uh, platoon sergeant, and we carried him back. And uh, my best friend was lobbing M79 grenades over my head to keep their heads down. And he hit a tree with one, and a piece of shrapnel came back and hit him in the chest. And he didn't tell me. We got the, got him medevaced out. And then my friend told me, Doc, can you look at my chest? I said, Rick, why didn't you tell me this earlier? But that was the type of guy he was. And that happened again later on after everything was over. Hey, can you look at my neck? And, because if he wasn't hurt bad, it, he didn't tell you. So, well, what, what what do you normally do when you come upon somebody? I mean, is there a, a, a specific thing you do all the time, or are the injuries different, or what? Yeah, all, all injuries are different, but you go by ABC airway, uh, bleeding, and circulation. So just basic first aid. Basic first aid. I mean, what kind of casualties were you seeing in Vietnam during that? Uh, gunshot. Shrapnel, uh, uh, legs blown off, arms. Uh, Did you have to encounter stuff like that? Uh, uh, legs, uh, both bones in the lower leg broken from shrapnel. Um, Lieutenant had a. A piece of his uh, skull missing from a, a rocket that hit him, and you could see his brain, but he was still alive. And was he talking? You remember? No, he 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 wasn't talking. He was unconscious, and normally head wounds bleed severely. He was not bleeding, and the. The VC, they like to get medics, and my they fired a rocket, one rocket, and my best friend yelled out, medic. I crawled up there, and as soon as I knelt over the lieutenant, well, no, nothing else was going on. As soon as I knelt over the lieutenant, Ten yards away, a machine gun opened up on me, and I just fell backwards. And I looked up, and I could see two inches above my face, uh, branches disappearing. They waited till I got there, but someone I don't know who came up, silenced that machine gun, so I can take care of him. And then I <clears throat> had uh, had him radio up to get another medic up because I had another one wounded. Neither one could move, and I ended up having seventeen in my platoon wounded within two hours that day, and that's why they uh, disbanded our platoon, we didn't have enough people. Is it like the movies or is combat, I know the answer to this, but or, uh, you, know, you can't really recreate it, but I mean, it's not like the movies. This is real life, this is happening, and uh, what, what's going through your head when you're seeing the casualties, the wounded? Are you freaking out? Are you, st are you just focused on your work? I, I was focused on my work. And actually, after I started treating the lieutenant, I don't remember hearing any more rockets go off, no more gunfire. It, it was all uh, out of my head. I was so concentrated on take, taking care of the wounded 
and most of the platoon was wounded by rockets because they fired so many of them. And, but I don't remember hearing any of them because I was hoping not to get hit and, but take care of the wounded. And for years it bothered me that all, virtually everyone, over the time I was there, virtually everyone in my platoon was wounded at least once. I didn't get a scratch. And I, at times I, I feel like I shouldn't be looked upon as them because they got wounded, I didn't. And, but at a reunion, we had, there were six of us. They told me how they felt about me. And I wondered all these years, all those years, what they thought of me. I couldn't talk. I fought back the tears. All I could do was go up and give each one a hug. Because I've always wondered what they thought of me. And I, I was always scared to death. And, but I always went up because they were my guys. I was in charge of them. Yes, it was the lieutenant's platoon, but they were my guys. Now, I don't know how you can get through something like that, you know, being a medic and everything that you saw and you came upon and, and getting those accolades from your buddies. I mean, that's... Uh, tell me about the camaraderie in combat. <laughs> there, <laughs> the brotherhood, whatever you want the, to call okay. it. Oh, it, that was there. But there was a lot of joking going on. Yeah. And one of my wounded that gave me this shirt a few years back, when I got to the platoon, he was on me because I was a cherry. I haven't been under fire. And he was always on me. I just let it roll off my back until after I took care of the uh, point man and I went up to him after it was all over. Kibby, am I still a cherry? He says, no doc, you're not. And they, they do anything for me. They protected me. Call you Cherry when you're first in country, right? That's that's what they did. Or newbie. Newbie. Until you make your first kill, or what's the deal? Uh, uh, well, there's other there's other names, but uh, yeah. I hear they. I've heard it said if you're going to get killed in Vietnam, it's going to be in the first few months because you're new and you don't know what to do, and yeah. you would stay away from the new guys. Yeah, that's it's. Right. Or they put them at point or something, you know. Uh. uh they usually didn't, well, in our platoon, they didn't put the new ones on point right away. Yeah. They, they were back in line so they could get some experience yeah. and get acclimated to the jungle. And that's what they did to me. But they, the lieutenant moved me up because after a short time, because that's where... If something was going to happen, that's where a medic should be. So I was up with up with lieutenant, and so if anything happened, I'd be close by. Tell me now, Stephen, about um, I, I guess we can't talk about the entire tour, but was there a more difficult battle that you were in, and, and or maybe you told me about the seventeen that were that that was that know, was the worst. You're fighting the, the Viet Cong, the, the North Vietnamese Army, or, or both, or what do you... I, well, I don't know who we were against that day. 
we actually we were on uh, stand down. We were on a fire base for supposed to be in for a rest to get showered, shaved, and we got ten new guys. And all I could think of, oh, guard duty's not going to be two and a half hours long. It might be only two hours. The next day, they said, pack up, we're going out. Afterwards, I heard they had information that they might have had a POW camp uh, outside of Tainan. And that was the only day we went in as a full company. Our platoon was on point, and we walked into the bunk bunker complex. And I don't know about the other platoons. I would like to find out what you know what kind of casualties they had, but I know some from second platoon came over to help. Well. Help me because the rest of the platoon, most of the platoon behind me was wounded. And one guy, short round, he says, Doc, you remember me jumping over you, over you while you were working on lieutenant? I said, No. <laughs> he was a machine gunner from the second platoon. And he came over, and uh, two other guys came over. And they were laying down a base of fire for me. And uh, as I said, I, di I didn't even hear it. But they, you took care of everybody. Everybody took care of everybody else. Tell me about the, the air mobile aspects of your work. Tell me about the Hueys going in and out of a landing zone and then loading the wounded on there, and your, your role in all that. Uh, as a medic, I was uh, always, well, the first cab was an air assault. Uh, a medic had to be on the first helicopter in, last helicopter out, in case there was wounded. And after two, three months, I, I was all, almost too scared to go, but I didn't want to be, I didn't want to show it. I just had the premonition I was going to get killed. Because, you know, they, they go for the first helicopter in because there's less people on the ground. And after uh, weeks or a month, I resigned myself that what's going to happen is going to happen. And uh, it didn't bother me anymore. And when they, if we had a lot of wounded, most of the time the infantry would put them on the helicopters because the medics were too busy. Uh, if there was just one or two and the medic wasn't needed, then the medic would go with the wounded to the helicopter. Um, any other stories about taking care of the wounded that come to mind, or is it all a blur, or is there specific stories of, of men you treated? And also, I'm curious as to what the wounded would say, if anything, when you were treating them, or what you would say to them. I would. Uh, try to calm them down. That that did a lot. Uh, the point man, the first one I treated, he was shot in the lower abdomen, and he he, he was worried it was too low. And after I, we brought him back, I told him, "You're okay. Don't worry about it." And that uh, relaxed him. And if it's a head wound, chest, or abdomen wound, you're not supposed to give morphine. 
He why, why is that? Uh, it could interfere or even kill. So he he asked for some morphine. Well, I knew I couldn't do it. I took out a needle, and I just stuck it in his arm, and told him I gave him morphine, and he calmed down more. So, yeah. it's you. You put a good light on things, and people don't understand. But we, you laugh at terrible things because if you didn't laugh. You'd go out of your mind. And you'd tell the wounded, aren't you lucky? Just think what would happen if it was over another inch. You know, you get the mind off the, off the wound. And just, you con them. Did anybody die in your presence? Um, I don't, not, not our guys. So nobody you treated actually died on you or in your arm? Not that I know of, no. Uh, we had uh, one VC that uh, I couldn't help. I tried, and to this day, I can still see him taking his last, trying to take his last breath and the breath coming out. and. It's not like the movies, they, they close their eyes when, they're, when they die. They don't close their eyes. I still see his eyes looking at me. Um, that was a Viet Cong? Yeah. It, it didn't matter to me. It, it was, he was a non-combatant at the time. He was wounded, I won't take care of him. Are you, are you a religious man back then? Do you, uh, yes. Do you pray at all? I mean, you remember yourself praying or getting through the hard times? Or yes, I took uh, no. Uh, my wife's uncle was a minister. He gave me a daily verse book, little booklet, and I read a verse every morning. That was what I did. It's interesting just to talk to you. And I've talked to corpsmen in World War II, chaplains in Korea, and some in Vietnam, and I just there, there's I think there's a spiritual side of war that you know that comes. And I, I you, you think about death. How how did people die? I heard violently. I heard they just silently, peacefully. <clears throat> I mean, you hear all these things. I've heard that the wounded will call for their mothers at times. Do you ever hear anything like that? I don't remember. I, I, I remember concentrating on their wounds. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And, yes, they did talk to me. Um, but I... I don't remember every much of anything they've said outside of the wound sure. and me talking to them to calm them down, telling them it's less than what it is, and because the more calm they are, the better they'll do. Were you in a, a Extreme firefights or just kind of sporadic? Fire it was uh, sporadic, but we had this that that one uh, major one. Did you ever see Forrest Gump? Yes. The movie, there's a there's a scene in there about Vietnam. Yeah. Going through the jungle, whatever. It started raining on it. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know why I thought about that, but I just to me it seems like that might have been a little bit of what it was like in a jungle and the, the fire you'd come under and walking point and the whole bit so yeah it monsoons you're wet 24 hours a day uh, weeks on end until we stay out three four five weeks 
and then you come in for uh, two days. If we're lucky, three. Yeah. But one of those days, you got to spend outside the perimeter for a perimeter guard. Yeah. But you're able to come in and get dry clothes. But other than that, you're you're wet 24 hours a day. Yeah. And I can remember on my birthday, my feet hurt so bad from being wet for so long. And well, a day or two later, the sun came out, and we were by an an opening, usually it was triple canopy jungle, and the lieutenant let us take a break in the sunlight, and we could take off our boots and dry our feet out. That really sticks to my, in my mind because, you know, your feet hurt and so bad, and then all of a sudden, you know, the lieutenant was nice enough to let us sit in the open, in the sun, to try to dry out. Uh, another time, we, a uh, mountain yard was going through a field. And we had, we called them Kit, Car Kit Carson Scouts. They were v NVA or VC that were taken prisoner and they came over to our side and they would be our interpreter. And we had ours call to him, and he stopped, and they talked, and he came up, and he uh, said there was a, a hamlet, or a group of people wanted to turn, Chuhoi, they called it, you know, turn themselves into Americans to get away from the NVA and VC. And he told the uh, interpreter that it was just a short distance. So they sent our platoon to follow him, go with him. And since we've, he said it was just a short ways, we brought no food. We just brought uh, maybe a canteen and our weapons. He, we never walked trail. He walked the trail and he was walking fast. We walked at least four hours, and by the time we got to the little village up in the mountains, it was getting dark. And they told the, the, our interpreter that the NVA come into the village, little hamlet, off and on. And we were out of artillery range. I had to hold the radio with the long antenna up and start tilting it around for the RTO to get radio contact with people in the back. But we were out of artillery range. Yeah. And so we had to spend the night and we positioned ourselves around them. And I, I laid down, the other guy was uh, taking watch, and I was just about asleep, and it was, I thought it was a grenade went off next to me. Come to find out, the, the Kit Carson scout found an SKS and was fooling around with it and just pulled the trigger. The bullet landed right next to my side. And hit dirt and, and blew the dirt and debris all over me. <laughs> the next morning, well, I went up and took it away from him. <laughs> next morning, I went over and dug that bullet out of the ground. I was going to keep it as a souvenir. But when I left country, they wouldn't let me take anything home. I took shrapnel out of people. They took that away from me. Yeah. They took that bullet. I took a bullet out of a guy. They took that away. They took the one that almost got me. They took that away. Only thing I got to bring home was an x-ray of a guy's leg that he begged me to take my place on a helicopter to demonstrate a jungle penetrator 
I said, okay, go ahead. The helicopter crashed. And I was working at a clearing station. That's where they brought the wounded that wouldn't make it to the hospital. So we, can, we had doctors there so we could stabilize them, then get them on to the hospital. I carried that uh, guy off the helicopter when they brought him in and his leg just fell. He, both bones just above the boot was broken. And we took x-ray and I took that x-ray and cut it down and put it in, so it fit in a paperback book. That was the only thing I was able to bring back from Vietnam. Can you tell me about, what do you remember about loading the wounded onto a helicopter? Was it chaotic? Was it quiet at the time? And, and uh, sometimes uh, when there's just uh, one or so, it's not chaotic. You just, you wait and you go with them. They, uh, they'll bring out a stretcher, put them on, get them on a helicopter, they're gone. Uh, I remember carrying a guy that had uh, his leg broken from shrapnel, and we had a small landing zone for the medevac to come in, and uh, the blades happened to hit some leaves, some branches, and it sounded exactly like an AK round, AK-47 round. I thought they got behind us and was shooting at us. I felt sorry for the guy, but I dove to the ground. <laughs> and I didn't hear him more, so I got him back on my, on my back and carried him to the, to the helicopter and just set him in. We, we packed him as full as we could. They were coming in and out uh, for hours. Mm -hmm. So when you treat the wounded, you didn't see any stuff like on Saving Private Ryan at the beginning of that movie. I don't know if you saw that movie, but you didn't see any horror scenes like that or blood and guts and arms and like, not that I want all that, but did you see a lot of that? I mean, no, not, not a lot, yeah. but a lot of uh, shrapnel wounds. They, 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 that shrapnel tears terribly. Did, did any of the memories bother you after the war, or was it really not as traumatic as maybe you thought it was going to be? I mean, it was it? It hit me later on in life, and I didn't know what was going on. And uh, about 17 years ago, it, it, it hit me real hard. And I still get uh, nightmares, flashbacks. Uh, Why did it wait so long to bother you? I mean, what? I don't know. That? I don't know. It well, actually it the worst of it started uh, after the Gulf War. I was personally. upset these uh, nothing against the soldiers mm -hmm. that went over and had a hundred hour war yeah. but when they got back they got parades and everything we got nothing all we got is was each other and even then, well, I kept in touch with one, one guy from Vietnam un until uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Brother-in-law put my name on the internet somewhere and I got a, a phone call and it was uh, one of the guys from the platoon. And t together, well, he did most of the work. And we got, he got like 23 names of, and addresses of guys that served together. And 
I got the list at home, and in the evening sometime, if I feel down or something, I'll just get the, get the list and give them a call. And Was it hard transitioning back into civilian life, or did it? Uh, not for me, because I think because I stayed in. I, I spent just over six years in. So I, I was still in the service after, afterwards for five, five more years. I, I got back in August. Uh, by November or December of that same year, I had my wife talking to me volunteering and going back, but I put down that I wanted to be a, med a medic on a medevac, and they turned me down, which is probably good. <laughs> so. How about um, just being a veteran, a Vietnam veteran, um, what is, you know, I, I ask this question, but what does freedom mean to you, you know, having served in Vietnam and being an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? Everything. I, I salute the flag, even, okay, I'm driving, I see the flag, I give it a salute. It means a lot to me. And being a veteran, uh, you see my car. It's for for me and for all veterans. The the pictures I have on the on the car. People respond positively to your car or negatively. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we'll. Uh, our VFW will have a Memorial Day service, or Veterans Day service, and I'll have my car there, and people go up, a lot of people go up and take pictures. Like I did. Yes, you did. I didn't know you did that. <laughs> um, I, I went to a reunion uh, just for the 12th Cav. And they saw my car. It was down in Branson, Missouri, two years ago, two and a half. They asked me to drive it in a parade. That that made me feel real real good. And we uh, they asked me to drive it in, in our Armed Forces Day parade in, here in St. Peter's that our VFW sponsors. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Extremely. Um, well, I am a first cab for life. I am a combat medic for life. It, that, that's me. Do you think it's important that we record these stories, Steve? I mean, for future generations. Yes, I do, and I, I've talked to high school kids, and ask them how much do they know, talk about, or learn about in history about Vietnam, and they say little or none, and I don't. I think that's right. They should go cover all the wars, all the conflicts. I agree. That's what I'm doing here, trying to get this done. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, well, you didn't really have a homecoming because you didn't come home. You stayed in the military, but a lot of people did. But um, my homecoming was coming home to my wife that I was married to 11 days before I went to Vietnam. And uh, two and a half, three months before I came home, she had an auto accident. 
and I got a letter, I don't know if, if it was from the Red Cross or from her mom, or it was two weeks old. Jerry had the accident, two weeks. It took me th three nights, it was a, they call it Mars Station, short wave. The atmosphere had to be right, mm -hmm. and the person in, on the West Coast, that volunteered their time would transfer the call to a landline. And so it was over two weeks. She had just gotten out of the hospital. And the Red Cross said, there's no need for me to come home. Her parents would take care of her. Uh, a day, she told me a day before she got, I got home, she got off crutches. So I took care of her because her, her knee and all the ligaments and tendons were torn up. So I was her therapist to keep, to keep that leg uh, moving. We're almost out of time, but I want to make sure before I shut off the camera, is there any other stories about being a, a medic? Uh, they called you Doc. I mean... Any, any other story that comes to your mind? If not, then, then that's fine. But uh, as far as being out in the field, working, um, tending to the wounded, um, if there's a particular story that maybe comes to your mind that maybe stands out more than the others as far as maybe the type of wound or the person or maybe you knew him or not. I mean, is there any other story? I mean, or is it just a day-to-day -day routine thing, nothing out of the ordinary? No. What? bothered me a lot was not knowing what happened to him. You put him on the helicopter, you never hear from him again. You don't know if they lived, died, how badly they were wounded, unless they came back. Well, they, sometimes you'd know they would be coming back because it, it'd be a, a minor wound. And bad enough to get out of the field for a few weeks to a month, but they'd come back to the platoon later on. But for most of them, I don't know what happened to them. So that, I, I, to this day, I wish I knew. And the lieutenant that I talked to about, about earlier, he was uh, new to our, pl our platoon, and no one remembers his name. And I've gone to the moving wall and had them search for a lieutenant in that time period. And there was no lieutenant that, was that had died in that time period. But with that head wound, he could have died later on. And I just wish I knew. So you didn't do surgery. You just did a little bit of first aid and patched him up? And was that it? In the field, yeah. Morphine if they needed it? If they needed it. I had one guy, that the one that had uh, his lower leg broke. He didn't want morphine. I said, you sure? He said, no. Okay. But I got, uh, the first CAV had a, try to go with the medics only stayed in the field X amount of time if they had medics to replace them because the tr trauma that they were under. Sure. So I got moved back to a clearing station and there, the doctors would let you do anything. Like I said, I, I was able to take shrapnel out of people. I've taken a bullet out. Uh, a doctor asked me to put it. He said, you want to put a chest tube in? I said, can I watch one first? But I, I worked until I, was, I got up in the morning. I was there waiting for wounded until I was tired at night. If I didn't have uh, didn't have to work the nights, 
I work until I was tired and go to bed. But that was very satisfying having them come in and you were able and you had the instruments and everything and a doctor to back you up. Because out in the field, you were on your own. It, you, it should have been a, a trauma sh surgeon in the field. Did you ever feel helpless? All the time. That's what I, I always went over different uh, situations in my mind as we were marching along. You know, what if this type of wound or that type of wound? Where, where, where is this in my aid bag? Where is that in my aid bag? I can imagine feeling helpless. Do you think you treated dozens or hundreds of casualties? Oh, um, dozens, is not not hundreds, but. Do you feel good at night when you go to sleep, like you did something and? Help somebody? Yes, I do, f I do feel good about myself. I hope I did no wrong. That, that's on my mind too. I, I just, I try to do my best and I, I hope I didn't do no harm. Tell me just quickly about the price for freedom. You saw men wounded, some died, and what would you tell a young person today who knows nothing about their freedom or what they have about the cost or the price of freedom, what would you tell them? It is high. It's not only the wounded. If, even if you don't get wounded, you've got memories. You will never lose those memories. It affects people, individuals differently. And Even now, I wish I could help, but uh, I don't know of any vets that I can help. I have talked to some. They've uh, found out I was a medic, and I was like a chaplain to them at times. They would come to me, and that was fine. I felt good about it. Quick question, the Vietnam Wall in Washington, you been there? No. I could not go for years and years. And maybe next year. Why wouldn't you go, you think? What was keeping you from going? I'm afraid to. I don't. I don't want to see all those names. You saw my film, there's a section in there about the wall. Yeah. But, you know, being there, it just, it scares me. I, 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 I do want to go. Right, and it's, it's getting there. Before, there was no way I could possibly go, but it's getting there, and I hope to go soon. If I didn't have things planned for this year, I didn't know it was a 25th anniversary of the wall. And if I'd known that, I would have made plans, because uh, some of the guys in my platoon are going. When is that? Uh, actually, the parade, well, that's on uh, November 11th, Veterans Day. And, but they have the parade, uh, I think they said the day before. That'd be the, a Saturday. That's today? Oh, the day ne before. Next week. The 10th, the 10th, yeah. Yeah, that'd be the 10th. Ne one week from today. And if I hadn't made plans a year ago, I probably would have gone with, uh, I think there's uh, four or five of them going. Good. And that, that would help being with them. But going by myself is scary. I'm gonna have you do one more thing. I'm gonna ask you, I asked all the veterans at the end of my interview to, 
to give me a salute into the camera. When I tell you from where you're seated, can you do that? Sure. Okay, look right into the camera, Steve, give me a salute. This is for the guys that didn't make it home. 